My aim today is uh, to talk about uh, the phenomenon of epistemic angst, uh, particularly as it's a social problem. Um, and what I'm going to try and do, the aims are up there and on your handout. Firstly, I'm going to try and articulate a distinctively social epistemic form of epistemic angst. Um, and I'm going to try and use it to explain distrust of uh, experts generally, uh, since that's in part what we're interested in uh, in this conference. Um, then I'm going to try and identify three structural problems. Uh, that I say sort of manifest epistemic angst, or I'm not sure exactly how to explain it, like they're sort of things of which epistemic angst might be uh, a sort of explaining factor or something like that. Well, you'll help me to clarify what's going on there. And then finally, I'm going to very briefly sketch a kind of partial solution to the problem of epistemic angst, or at least I'm going to sort of indicate the direction in which we might go uh, if we think this is a real kind of thing. Uh, let's get into it. So. What even is epistemic angst? Um, it is pretty much what it uh, like sounds like. Uh, it does what it says on the tin. That is, uh, it's a feeling of kind of anxiety, vertigo, like fear, uh, a sort of uh, a generalized malaise that one can get into when one contemplates the precarity of one's epistemic situation, right? That is, you know, when you come to think about how radically mistaken you could be about absolutely everything you know, um, and what a kind of like faulty reasoner, a faulty truth detector, a kind of faulty practical agent you might be, that could be a really kind of effective physical, effect, emotional kind of experience, not just a kind of theoretical uh, one in the lab or in the, in the philosophy classroom, right? So that's the kind of uh, notion I'm trying to get off the ground here. But of course, I'm not the only person uh, in the history of philosophy, clearly, who's uh, thought that something like this attends our epistemic situation. So uh, there's a long tradition that starts with like at least uh, Descartes. I myself think that kind of academic and Peronian forms of skepticism are sort of different. You might have a different interpretation. Be that as it may, at least from Descartes up through like Wittgenstein and more recently with people like Ernie Sosa and of course Duncan Pritchard who has a book about this, people have worried about this phenomenon of epistemic angst and how it can be sort of like crippling to the deployment of our theoretical and practical reason, right? But what I am going to say is that all of these people have thought of, of epistemic angst as a kind of deeply personal Cartesian sort of problem, right? Indeed, it's kind of antisocial in the sense of being totally compatible with like complete solipsism, right? Um, so this kind of deeply personal kind of Cartesian problem is of a kind where you know you worry that you can't rule out you know the new evil demon problem or that you're a brain in a vat right or that you you know you sort of have no access to the external world um, you're you know in the in the throes of some like you know evil scientist who's uh, tricking you with chemicals whatever it may be right and that's going to be because either you can't rule out uh, the truth of the, the skeptical hypothesis or you know your evidence underdetermines which of the skeptical hypothesis or you know your general knowledge claims are true and so on right okay so that's the traditional form of epistemic angst um, and whilst I think it's important I also don't think it's like all that pervasive for normal people i.e non-philosophers um, uh, for most people like I think occasionally we worry about this kind of thing and maybe there are kind of spikes in the collective consciousness worrying about this like when the matrix came out or the Truman Show, right? Or if you go down too many rabbit holes about like simulation theory on the internet, right? But by and large, I think most people are kind of pretty happy that the external world is real and that we have like, we're generally okay at tracking it at least as like, a, you know, a sort of species, all right? Um, however, I think there is a much more pervasive and to my mind, much more important, practically important form of epistemic angst. And that is as a kind of deeply social interpersonal problem, right? So that is when we come uh, face to face with people who, so peers, in the cases of peer disagreement, who have access to the same evidence that we do, um, and who appear to be at least on their face of it kind of equally rational or at least equally capable of deploying rational capacities, and they have radically different views to our own, whether that be evaluative views or normative views or empirical views, that can seem to undermine our sense that we're reasonable trackers of the truth or that there is some shared truth for us to work out or that we're capable of kind of engaging in practical deliberation and deploying our rational agency to make Make, like good decisions about how to live our lives or make decisions for those for whom we're responsible or contribute to like the collective enterprise of like deciding what to do about climate change or whatever it may be right um, so the idea here is that this kind of like interpersonal form of doubt like where we kind of worry that either neither of us has good epistemic standing or one of us doesn't have good epistemic standing but we're not sure which one is a much more like concerning and practical kind of interpersonal problem that generates this kind of really visceral feeling of like oh my god I don't know if any of us are doing any good at this at all. Okay, or at least that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to like put forward as the idea and I'm going to suggest that this kind of phenomenon of epistemic angst is also a little bit kind of has a kind of 
like quicksand like uh, quality to it which is like as you try and extricate yourself from it the more you kind of struggle the more you find yourself sort of bound up uh, and sinking deeper and deeper into it okay so what I'm going to try and do is uh, say a little bit about why I think that's the case. I'm going to offer these kind of three cases that I think exemplify this sort of like quicksandy kind of phenomenon. Um, I'm not going to suggest that they're insoluble. Um, I'm just going to suggest that they show how the like wriggling makes us uh, even more and more immersed and enmeshed in these kind of problems. And then I'm going to suggest a little like way of maybe navigating our way out. So we have this angst concerning our good epistemic standing uh, in our community. It goes to the core of how we perceive ourselves. And I mean, some other people in the... Uh, in the conference so far have made the very excellent point that, for example, we can have practical reasons uh, to like behave in motivated reasoning or other forms of kind of confirmation bias or whatever, because, for example, the beliefs that we happen to have become very core to our sense of like our social or political identity, right? That can be a kind of thing that explains our motivated reasoning in various fora. What I'm trying to say is there's a kind of deeper and agential analogue of that kind of identity protecting reasoning that concerns our status, our perception of ourselves like qua Noah or like qua rational agent, right? Now, I don't take that to be in competition with the idea that we have engage in motivated uh, reasoning to protect our social or political identity. In fact, I think that having a social or political identity is kind of premised on the idea that we also have an upstream kind of rational knowing agency that like helps to explain why it could be possible that we have a social or political identity. Entity, right? And so the idea here is that just in the same way that sometimes challenges to our beliefs that come from experts or from peers or alleged peers um, can lead us to engage in motivated reasoning because we're worried about how they affect our social identity, so too, if I'm right about this kind of epistemic angst thing, actually we have a far, more, a far deeper and more entrenched reason uh, to worry about that kind of uh, challenge to our belief set because it challenges the possibility or challenge brings to light the possibility that the situation is far worse than we thought, that it's not just our social or political identity that is being challenged, it's rather the fact that we're not at all a competent knower or tracker of the truth at all. Attending this kind of angst, this kind of fear, I think is, you know, as people have pointed out in terms of conspiracy theories and that sort of thing, is the thought that we might be sort of found out to be hoodwinked by people or that there are like people out there who are somehow kind of controlling the strings or uh, sort of fabricating parts of reality that we, you know, if we're not careful, will be like led down the garden path into believing, right? That's part of what I take to explain kind of weird theories on the internet. And my thought is that this also kind of buys into this sort of epistemic angst problem. They're like the modern analog, like QAnon are like the modern analog of the new evil demon problem. That's basically what's going on, in my view. Um, so in all of these cases, right, I think that what part of what's going on is the concern that um, we're going to be found out either to ourselves or to others to have been radically wrong about many of the things we thought were, were most confident and most justified in believing, and that damages our sense of self in a really pernicious and important way. So one potential solution uh, you might think, and this is the first of the kind of quicksand sort of moves, um, is you might think, okay, what we need to do is promote the idea that there's really nothing all that wrong with discovering that you were wrong about a lot of things, right? Indeed, it's sort of epistemically virtuous to admit when you're wrong. It actually shows that you're a good epistemic agent, a reliable tracker of the truth. Um, and so it's not like bad uh, to have made lots of kind of cognitive or factual mistakes. Indeed, you know, that just happens to the best of us, right? All, all knowers. Uh, it's a sort of feature of what it is to be a rational agent and a knower that you're going to make mistakes and you should own up for them when that happens. You can probably see where I'm going to this, right? So where I'm going with this. So if we kind of want to promote the idea that even the best knowers regularly make lots and lots of mistakes, um, then we're going to have to start to promote the idea in part, you might think, that experts make mistakes all the time. Um, since they are sort of paradigmatically, epistemically the best placed people. That's what makes them experts, right? Um, and so the idea is going to be something like, well, so on the one hand, you might think we should promote the idea that you know, experts are regularly making lots of mistakes, that you know, in 30 years, a lot of what people who are experts think now is obviously true will be taken to be obviously false by the next generation of experts, that experts get predictions wrong all the time, they disagree with each other all the time, and so on, right? But you can probably see where I'm going with this. You start promoting that idea as a sort of alleged antidote to the epistemic angst that comes from worrying that you know, there are people who are better knowers than you. And instead, what ends up happening is you start broadening the epistemic angst, right? You, the rot sets in because now, not only are you worried about your own epistemic standing, um, but you also start to worry that experts too are no better than the rest of us. And that indeed leads us to think that the entire understanding of our community is in serious jeopardy, right? Because if it turns out that lots of what we currently think is obviously true is going to turn out to be obviously false in 50 years time, then that can make it seem like there's no point in listening to experts at all about what's going on right now, since ultimately they're going to be found to be wrong, just like the rest of us. 
Okay, so that's the kind of uh, thought that I have. It's something like, well, in trying to sort of uh, uh, kind of counter off the problem of epistemic angst as it faces uh, us individually and collectively by pointing out that everyone makes mistakes, we then sort of fuel further epistemic angst as we start to realize that, oh my God, everyone's making way more mistakes than we already thought. So that's supposed to be sort of pickle number one uh, for, for, for the would-be uh, solution to epistemic angst. Okay, second uh, sort of, again, kind of pickle problem, uh, dialectical enmeshment, I don't know what to call it. Um, okay, but this is under three on your handout, um, and that is, I'm describing a sort of common sense alienation and epistemic paternalism. Many of you will uh, know already that there's this uh, kind of emergent, so to speak, uh, field in the social sciences in particular um, of complexity theory, right? People doing crazy stuff with numbers to explain, you know, the dynamics of social phenomena. Um, and I'm following in particular here uh, the work of, of Duncan Watts. I don't know if you guys know, he's a famous uh, sorry, sociologist, was at Columbia, he now does weird stuff with data at Yahoo. Um, but the basic point of, of this kind of emergence, complexity theory stuff about lots of kind of socially salient phenomena like you know, economics and policy making and you know, epidemiology or whatever it may be, um, is that common sense analyses of complex social, economic and policy issues tend to mislead us like systematically into thinking that we understand far more about the world around us than we really do. Um, and that's because actually like understanding most of these phenomena that seem like they're amenable to kind of common sense reasoning, that they seem like they're the kind of thing that you could read about in a newspaper and get a kind of intuitive grip on, are actually only explicable in terms of like you know, massive numbers of kind of micro level interactions between stuff that is only like really able to be understood in terms of super complicated mathematical models. Um, and that actually like we're far better at landing like a rocket on a particular point on the moon than we are at understanding like how changing like the minimum wage will affect what happens in like a particular country at a particular time. That's the basic idea. And like people like Daniel Kahneman and others have done like a bunch of research that suggests something like this might be true, okay. So what should we make of, of, of the, this kind of phenomenon? How does it tie in with epistemic angst? Well, I, I'm feeling anxious. You guys probably, I don't know if you are as well when you think about this. But the basic idea is as follows, right? So, you know, it seems on the one hand kind of essential to the well, like the good functioning of our kind of epistemic society and community that, and democracy indeed, that we're able to sort of boil down the findings of expert testimony into ways that are comprehensible to the ordinary person without a huge amount of technical training, right? So you shouldn't have to have a sort of statistics PhD or maths PhD to understand what's going on in sort of behavioral economics or how we should like think about the minimum wage or monetary policy or whatever. It seems like it's important to the functioning of kind of healthy democracy that these sorts of things can be explained to lay people in terms of understand so that they can then make evaluative poly de policy decisions about them, right? So that the, and this happens every time you open a newspaper, right? And you think about whether or not you think they should, you know, like improve the, the, the sort of like rates of casual workers in the education sector or whatever it may be, right? We assume that this is something that we can reason about using our non-technical reasoning capacities. Okay, the problem is that if this kind of strand in kind of complexity theory is right, then that's not actually possible at all. Um, and it's kind of a mistake to think that we can engage in intuitive reasoning about these incredibly complex matters. Like there's a sense in which we think like, oh, I'm a human, I know other humans, so I'll be able to use my kind of common sense to understand how humans would behave in this situation. And the problem is that that turns out to be, in many cases, systematically misleading. But that puts us into the following kind of bind, right? And I don't have an answer here. This is just more epistemic angst quicksand, right? So on the one hand, you might think, okay, experts should continue to try and set out uh, the kind of common sense version of their mathematical, mathematically modeled reasons or whatever. Try and set out the uh, explanation for their complex uh, policy proposals in ways that we can kind of understand. Because if they don't do so, um, then we're not going to be able to participate in the way that we need to. That leads to a sort of epistocracy kind of problem. Um, and it's going to sort of significantly heighten uh, angst if they go around, you know, like failing to deliver their reasons uh, and just, you know, kind of like, you know, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where it turns out that the Earth is like this huge uh, experiment and spits out the answer like 42 to the meaning of life. Well, that's kind of like what this would be like, right? If we took this kind of complexity theory stuff seriously, they just be like, yeah, the answer is like this. Why? Oh, well, because of a really complicated model, you have no chance of understanding. Like that would be deeply unsatisfying and it doesn't sound very democratic either. But on the other hand, like setting out the common sense and intuitively graspable propositions, you know, that are supposed to be graspable for us is if this is right, like systematically misleading, right? They're not actually helping us to get a grip on what's going on in society or to appraise real world issues. They're just giving us a certain degree of comfort that we're not in this hopelessly angsty epistemic position. 
So that's the kind of second dilemma. Um, again, no root out, uh, or no obvious root that I can see. Uh, it's rather just to point out that like, this is a very anxiety inducing situation. And then uh, the final uh, of this kind of, uh, of these three kind of tricky problems that I wanted to point out, you know, kind of exemplifying or something like that epistemic angst um, is under four on your handout. Um, and I'm calling kind of natural is ought detectors. Um, and again, this, is, this concerns problems with expertise. Um, so the idea here is something like, well, you know, many people in this room are philosophers or like philosophy adjacent and so are like very intimately acquainted with various problems about like the fact value distinction, whatever that's supposed to be, um, or certainly the sort of illegitimacy of reasoning to various sorts of modal claim from straightforwardly descriptive claims, right? Like that's, this is bread and butter, uh, early stuff that, you know, in, in your philosophical or other training that you can't go from a string of claims about what has happened or what is happening to like deductively valid claims uh, or even necessarily well, like well inferentially supported claims about what we ought to do or about what will happen if we take some, uh, some course of events as given it for, for the counterfactual, right? Okay, why is this relevant to trusting in expertise? Well, um, this problem that we have in, in philosophy and elsewhere about uh, kind of like reasoning from is to ought, I think that like most people uh, in the general public actually uh, have like quite a good intuitive grip of this problem, or at least something like an intuitive grip of this problem is explaining a lot of skepticism uh, that comes about when we turn in kind of expertise from like, here's what's going on, or here's an explanation of what has happened to here's the policy proposal we recommend to solve this problem, right? So I think what happens, or here's what will happen if we fail to take the particular action that we, the experts, say that we ought to do, right? I think basically what happens is people are kind of skeptical of that move. And they have some reason to be skeptical of that move precisely because, you know, the best philosophers are still trying to struggle with it and also think it's a kind of illegitimate move, right? So this kind of also serves to undermine, if you like, the kind of move from have the possession of kind of descriptive or explanatory expertise towards the kind of uh, explanation of why we should take seriously the proposals, like, or take more seriously the proposals of experts on various important matters than we should those of the everyday folk. And that kind of dovetails with this kind of common sense problem, you know, the problem that we just discussed, right? Because if experts make kind of like, or attempt to make clear the kind of intuitive grounds of their beliefs uh, for like some policy proposal, their understanding of what's going on, then many of the folk, and like this is the whole premise of, you know, reading newspaper articles and deciding who to vote for, feel like they're now equipped with the necessary facts to evaluate pr proposals and make their own proposals about we what we should do. Um, since, you know, there's no reason to think, and indeed a number of people at this conference have emphasized the fact that just because you have the scientific knowledge or other technical knowledge doesn't qualify you any more than the average person to make good policy proposals or moral proposals or evaluative proposals. Now, I'm not sure that's true, um, since I think that the kind of fact value stuff uh, when it comes to solving technical problems is very much bound up with the technical, like, with understanding the technicalities of the problem itself. Um, but be that as it may, I think this is like a further illustration the kind of problems that we can get into once we start taking seriously uh, this kind of epistemic angst type stuff. Now, of course, this problem is compounded by the fact that we also now have lots and lots of data suggests that experts aren't all that good at predicting what's going to happen in the future, at forecasting, certainly if they forecast anything more than like the very immediate future. Um, they tend to run into all kinds of problems. Carmen has this whole thing about how often, like looking at like international relations experts, that their predictions about what's going to happen after the Cold War were no better than the toss of a coin. Uh, you know, so like we should indeed worry about the forecasting capacities of experts in a whole heap of domains. Um, so what should we do about this particular part of the kind of forecasting, predicting, solving kind of problem? On the one hand, right, you might think, well, like, well, look, experts are probably going to do better than the rest of us, right? So although we could kind of admit that experts do pretty badly, um, at the same time, we could kind of be like, well, look, counterfactually, if you were in their shoes and you were trying to predict, but without their expertise, you'd do even worse. Right? It seems unlikely that that kind of like widespread knowledge of that fact would actually improve people's confidence in the epistemic standing of the community. Why? Well, because what we're saying is, well, experts get things right 50% of the time, maybe a little bit less, you're going to do worse. So now it seems like what we're telling people is that mostly our predictions and proposed solutions for complex social problems are going to do no better than a flip of a coin. That doesn't seem to generate like more confidence in our epistemic standing or system. Indeed, it seems to generate less. Um, but the alternative of kind of continuing to pretend that we can all do a great job of like making policy proposals or predictions or solving things off the back of kind of, you know, what we read in the newspaper is also equally misleading, right? 
Um, so again, it seems like we're in a kind of epistemically more dire kind of practical situation than many of us uh, recognize most of the time. Those are the three kind of problems that are supposed to exemplify the kind of role that epistemic angst plays or you know, uh, the sorts of things that we can explain by appeal to epistemic angst maybe or something like that. Um, okay, so now um, I just want to say a few things about where we might think uh, a, a solution or the beginnings of a solution uh, might lie for this. And I, I was I, I, in my own epistemic angst uh, lying awake uh, last night thinking about the adequacy of this solution and, and I'm convinced it's not all that good. The slogan is going to be like social problem, social solution. I have like sort of naturalized epistemology, like social epistemology leanings. Uh, so that's the way I'm going to kind of go for this. And I guess the starting point, I think, is to say something which um, a number of people at this conference have already said, and I think the point was very well made, which is that like, we seem to be very good uh, at, in society at like calling out examples of fallacious reasoning and of like people behaving in ways that are contrary to the evidence that they had. Um, and we do far less of a good job uh, of pointing out in advance what good epistemic norms look like or what epistemically virtuous reasoning would look like in advance or what the shared norms are even supposed to be, right? Um, and so I think like it's at like, you know, at a minimum, it's kind of counterproductive to uh, criticize people for their obviously fallacious uh, reasoning that leads to kind of very non-truth apt uh, beliefs or desires or whatever it may be. Um, and at worst, it's like deeply unfair, right? Because often what we do when we say like, you know, um, like this was an obviously irrational uh, view for this person to have formed about, you know, whatever the liz lizard people that control society are or whatever it may be, um, is that we uh, like likely they're going to dig in. Not just, as I said before, and as the people at the conference have already said, because um, they have this kind of deep desire or need uh, to protect their social or political identity, but because you know, there's an upstream concern that pointing out uh, once people are already deeply invested in some view or set of views that they're deeply irrational and obviously evidence insensitive is, prevents a really deep challenge to people's sense of themselves as reliable agents and knowers, right? So I agree with what's already been said at this conference that it's too late, right? Once someone's seriously invested in some irrational set of views and beliefs to start criticizing them on that basis. So instead, I think what we need to be doing, um, and of course, like, you know, since I have a philosophical bent, I would think that the answer lies in philosophy, is to like promote in advance a shared set of collective norms, epistemic norms, right? A sort of version of like epistemic public reason, right? Now, how, why do I think that's kind of different to what's going on now? I mean, obviously we don't spend a lot of time doing this, but even since there are lots of philosophers who already think we should do that, I think part of the problem is that a lot of our kind of promotion of public epistemology to the extent that that happens is that it exemplifies like knowledge first kind of epistemology, right? So to the extent that we are concerned with like meta level epistemic discourse in public discourse, it tends to be about things like knowledge and facts and factivi factivity and truth and truth aptness, right? These are the kinds of things, that's why we get people talking about like alternative facts, you know, or like why people are just like obviously wrong about how the world really is or whatever, right? Instead, I think we need to make like a methodological move, right? I think that what we should be promoting is not things about whether things are true or false or like factive or truth apt or whatever, but instead we need to be talking about which sorts of patterns of inference and reasoning exemplify good, uh, like conformity with epistemic norms that are like agreed upon in advance and are sort of a publicly promoted as virtuous ways of thinking about things. So the first and most obvious one I think is that like, people are more likely to succeed in conforming with virtuous epistemic norms if they know in advance what those epistemic norms are supposed to be. And correspondingly, people are more likely to respond to criticisms that they failed to conform to shared epistemic norms if they know that in advance there were some shared epistemic norms of which they either did or could have known about, right? That's my first thought. So we're likely to be more effective and also likely to be fairer in criticizing people uh, if we have a shared set of epistemic norms. Um, the second point, right, uh, and this is kind of supposed to be the neat uh, tie-off to this epistemic angst problem, it doesn't solve it, but it, I think it's supposed to help, is like, to some extent, moving away from knowledge first or kind of truth aptness conceptions of public epistemology and towards a kind of shared kind of practical collective instrumental epistemology is going to play a significant role, I think, in diffusing some types of epistemic angst. Why is that? Well, um, you know, you may have had this experience like in uh, high school when you're doing maths um, and there's some complicated long maths problem 
and you do a lot of the reasoning, a lot of the steps uh, really well, uh, but you forget to carry a two, uh, you know, you forget to, like, to cross out a double negative and turn it into a positive, right? So you get the completely wrong answer, like radically wrong, because there's only one right answer to a maths problem. But then you get lots of marks for your working. Uh, in fact, you get almost full marks, because like the maths teacher is like, yeah, you did everything right, but like everyone forgets to carry a two now and then. Um, so I think that's the kind of epistemic environment in which we need to operate, right? Because if you focus on just truth or falsity or facts, non-facts, right? Um, then the stakes are either you're right or you're wrong. And either you're like radically right or most likely you're radically wrong. Um, and this preserves, pre presents a serious threat to people's sense of themselves as decent knowers. But if instead you have a kind of norms first version of epistemology, right, then actually you're sort of like applauded for the extent to which you manage to conform to the relevant norms, even if, um, as many people have pointed out here, you know, certain bits of false evidence at certain crucial stages of your reasoning will mean that you get a radically wrong answer, right? But just like the maths problem example, like that doesn't mean you're a really bad epistemic agent. It just means that we're all susceptible to certain types of minor carrying errors or cancelling errors or whatever, which lead to getting a radically wrong result and prevent us getting the right result, even though we're epistemically virtuous and are good knowers. Um, so I think this kind of solution, uh, or the promotion of this kind of solution, might help to solve the kind of uh, epistemic angst problem. The final kind of payoff I want to mention uh, before I finish is like, so I think if there's a shared sense of the epistemic norms that govern inquiry in a community, uh, then this also brings about a kind of sense that the success of technocrats, experts, whatever, experts, scientists, whatever, who also use those norms, but who use them in non-typical ways because they have particular sorts of training or specialization. It means that like their successes become our successes in a way that um, kind of gels the epistemic community together much more closely than I think it is currently. So in that sense, if you have a, base, if a shared epistemic basis on which we're all inquiring together, rather than you know, you're, you're inquiring over here siloed, they're inquiring over there, but in a way better than you or something, um, then it becomes just kind of straightforwardly epistemically virtuous to yield to expert evidence when it's given. Why? Well, because in some sense, like their success is your success and you're admitting your, that the, the beliefs you previously held were false isn't sort of an admission that you were epistemically fail to be virtuous. Instead, it's epistemically virtuous to admit that you were wrong. So the fact that you sort of admit that uh, you were wrong previously and that the expert evidence is now what you should believe is just another sign that you're in good epistemic standing rather than the other way around. Um, and that's, that's all I've got. Thanks very much.